All right. Um, I uh, was just going through my slides and I noticed that I was doing a very rude thing because I actually left out the acknowledgement slide. Um, so I just before I forget, I'm also very grateful to the organizers for inviting me here yet again. Um, I just want to put in your head a really simple idea, and it's going to be short and sweet. Uh, although the title is kind of long and pompous, but I think we probably, most of us know what we mean by the tree of life, right? We believe that everything in biology only makes sense in the light of evolution, things are related to one another, and that pattern of relatedness is the tree of life. And it's not just sort of an evolution concept, it's also something that you can build information architectures around. And I'll just show you what I mean with a simple example that uh, came up two weeks ago. Uh, an example that's actually been made possible also by earlier work that started at the uh, 2008 Biohackathon in Tokyo, namely a simple URL API called FinoWS. Uh, I'll show you what we did. So, I've been in Kyoto a little bit longer because I was teaching a course here as well. Um, you can see that this was the logo of the course, so I'm, I'm wearing a t-shirt. And uh, what we did is we had some uh, students, grad students and postdocs come over who uh, wanted to uh, do larger scale phylogenetic analyses. So we taught them um, uh, how to use scripting languages, how to use uh, open bio toolkits to access phylogenetic data programmatically and uh, transform it and do interesting stuff with it. And we worked through a bunch of uh, problem sets. And, um, one of them was to build a large phylogeny uh, and then do interesting things with it. And what we did is we started out with the um, the Tree of Life web project, so that is uh, located at tollweb.org. It's a curated backbone of the Tree of Life, so there's experts who contribute to that and to sort of give the consensus opinion of the systematics of their you know, group that they're the experts of. And this project also has a service interface and um, there's, you can access it through this FinoWS URL API. And what you then get back is, um, so you give a URI for a node in the Tree of Life, and what you get back is that node and its immediate children, and then whatever metadata we have for any of those nodes. So for example, is this an extinct node? What is the taxonomic rank? And other stuff. And so this was the point where the students learned to apply recursion because we gave them the root node of the primates and then they had to recurse up the tree, fetch the children of that root node and then their children and their children and progressively sort of graph together a skeleton of the primate tree. So they did that, but then uh, actually on the uh, Tree of Life web project, some of the nodes at the tips are uh, not fully resolved. So they might be, for example, a genus. And uh, we want to know, at least know which species are in that genus. So then we access another service, uh, another set of URLs uh, here provided by Ubio. And Ubio is a project that um, tries to align different taxonomies and record names that are being used for species in the literature. And so we use that to sort of reconcile the names we had in our tree with standard taxonomies. And we could also use that then to fetch the species that go into any one genus. And another thing that was very handy was that the bio records, um, so the data that's returned, uh, also uh, contains links to yet other projects um, that talk about those same species. So for example, one of those links was to the tree-based project. And again, this uses the same sort of uh, URLs, so it's really easy to just write sort of generic clients. And we access TreeBase to get additional data about the systematics of primates. So you get additional smaller trees that maybe have something to do with you know, the phylogeny of macaques or of some other group. And so we pull those all in, and then we use this super tree approach, which is basically a, a 
a technique for combining the topologies of smaller trees to come up with a larger composite topology. And we used that to further resolve the tree that we had. So at this point, we had a very nicely resolved uh, topology of uh, nearly all the primates. We had about 220 species. Uh, you know, give or take, there might be maybe 250, or, you know, depends who you ask. And what we did detect now, when those different species branched off from each other, right? We had the tree shape, but we didn't know when those different splits happened. Now, um, we had some molecular data already, so we could estimate relative branch lengths, but not absolute ones. So then we accessed time tree, and time tree is another uh, curated database that um, you give it two uh, NCBI identifiers, two taxon identifiers, and it gives you the age of the most recent common ancestor between those two. And thanks to our Dubai query that we've done earlier, we had also already fetched the uh, NCBI ID. So we could very easily then traverse the tree and get the ages for the different nodes and use those as anchors to then calibrate our molecular branch length estimates. So at this point, we also knew when these things had happened, when these speciation events had happened over the course of climate evolution. Now, another thing that we were interested in is to find out actually where those species occur. So here we had to uh, hack a little bit more ourselves because there's this thing called GBIF which records occurrences of species, right? So people go out somewhere in field to field work, they see a monkey and they upload the latitude and longitude of that observation. So we did that, um, but we had to write a client that accesses this XML API that they have to get all these lab long coordinates for all these different species. So at this point now, we have a tree that is very richly semantically annotated, right? We have the metadata from the tree of life, we have the metadata from the bio, we have the metadata from tree base, we have the metadata from time tree, and we have these lab long coordinates. So it is sort of this tree has become overgrown with uh, all kinds of different types of information, and we want to be able to view those in different ways. And uh, one way that we could do that is to then um, uh, export our tree as KML to look at it in Google Earth. So you can kind of see now I collapsed this to genus level, but uh, you can kind of see what's going on here. So at the top right there is uh, the root of the primate tree. And then you see these two plates here range off. So that group combined is called the strepsorites. And down here, this is Madagascar. So you might know that those are lemurs. Um, and the other group there are the lorises. And then we have here the old world monkeys and then the new world monkeys with one branch here between them. So this is one view in the kind of metadata we were able to fetch together from all these different um, uh, projects. So that was pretty neat. We ended up with a tree that's sort of you know, overgrown with epiphytes, if you like. So we have taxonomic data, molecular data, biogeographic data, paleontological data. And we can view it in a number of different ways. Um, now, well, I'm sure you, know, you might have noticed during the talks that there's a number of different problems that keep coming up. How do we deal with identifiers? What are proper URIs? Are we all using the same ones or not? Um, and this was an issue here as well. Are we using the same predicates? How do they map onto each other? There was a lot of hacking still involved to make it all work. And uh, hopefully this week we'll clear up you know, this issue a little bit more. But at least we got some results, and I wanted to put that idea in your head, that we can use the tree of life to build stuff on top of it. Thank you.